This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. Today. We're in the Wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. Okay, here we go. Welcome to another episode of the Wedge Live podcast. My guest today is Devin Hogan, the Minneapolis DFL chair. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Devin. Uh, thank you. It's an honor. Um, this is the first podcast I've ever um attended, I guess, or appeared on. So very exciting. And you are, I think you're the most powerful power broker we've had on the podcast so far. All right. It feels good to be a uh, volunteer power broker. So (laughs) yeah, you put in a lot of work for no money. I do. Minneapolis. Uh, For funsies, mostly. Um, You you just get yelled at for fun. Yes. Um, so I know exactly what I was getting into, getting yelled at for fun. Um, but what I didn't expect was how quickly it would happen. Uh, so I was first elected in 2018. Uh, you were there. That convention was at the North High Gymnasium. And uh, they had literally just finished counting the votes. And I had gone from the, the front of the room where they announced it, was walking to the back of the gym. And somebody pulled me aside and started yelling at me about sitting on the bleachers for six hours. And so all I could say was, I agree, it sucks. <laughs> Bleachers for six hours. Yeah, that, that's um, what you signed up for. In that convention, because I but just got this. Done. This and and this year we're not going to be sitting on bleachers for six hours, right? Correct. Yes. Um, this year we're going to be sitting on our computers, sitting on our phones, uh, possibly sitting outside on our computers or our phones. Um, but because of the pandemic, obviously, um, the the state party and uh, the Minneapolis DFL decided that we should not gather in person. And um, so it's pretty easy. Um, you sign up online. If you don't have a computer, uh, you can call a phone number or text a phone number. I can give you those numbers later. Um, but um, yeah, you sign up. You have the month of April to sign up. Um, you'll get a ballot in mid-May to vote for the delegates at your precinct. And then uh, if you are elected a delegate, get ballots um, for June, early June for the ward conventions and city convention. So sort of a hybrid of um, last year, the state party uh, did electronic balloting. And so we're using that. But this year we had to reinvent the caucuses for the Internet. So that's sort of the big difference. I can explain about how it goes. People are going to... Go ahead. So caucusing, you can do it on a Google form, you can text, you can you can call, right? Yes. Those are the three methods? Yes, yeah. And so the caucuses, for those that aren't familiar with caucuses, um, so I'm, I'm a big caucus proponent. I, I come from Cook County, Illinois, um, home of the Mayor Daly machine. And um, I didn't know that people, individuals in our democracy had the ability to actually choose um, the people they represent them. I'm, I'm used to um, the mayor and the daily machine telling us who we get and we like it. And um, the only opportunity for change, at least until very recently, was waiting for someone to die, essentially, and then their child to be appointed in their place. So I, I personally am a huge evangelist for caucuses. And so for those of you that don't know, it's your precinct is the sort of the lowest um unit of government and it's it's i don't know the exact numbers but it's it's uh, usually in within minneapolis you know part of a neighborhood possibly a whole neighborhood and you gather with all of those the caucuses you gather with all the in, in, in our case democrats in your neighborhood go to say like the park or a local school gym something like that you argue about politics that you agree with um and then one of the things that you do on caucus night is you elect delegates to um, endorse. So you elect people in your precinct on your behalf to endorse um, Democratic candidates that are running for office. And so all we're doing is replicating that on the Internet. And there's a lot of multiple steps that happen in person in this process that we have to make multiple steps over the course of several weeks on the Internet instead of one evening on a Tuesday night. So. So to use the the Google form method as an example, 
you're putting in your name and address and are you, you're indicating candidate preferences on that first that first form exactly yes so when you go to a normal caucus um they say hey whoever it's called sub caucusing and so if there, there's a limited number of delegates for each precinct and um if you are interested in say a candidate you can again in an in-person caucus pick a corner of the room people that support that candidate go in that corner of the room so on and so forth so on the form that you sign up to register this year you're you're essentially yes you pick a candidate for both the ward and for the city so every single person in your precinct who appears on that ballot um, you can choose for both at the ward level and the city level city level meaning uh, park board board of estimate and mayor you can also be undeclared undeclared is always an option um, but essentially we had to pre so normally you could bring your own causes your own um, people you support as as what you're sub caucusing for but we had to pre-write them this year, so we just did it around all the candidates. So um, everyone who signs up, the form, it's the forms in four languages, English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong. So name, address, um, things that you would normally identify when you're going on caucus night, name, address. Uh, we're asking for your birth year. Um, the reason why is a lot of people aren't very good at um, giving us their full address. Um, so like, for example, um, if your name is John Smith and you live in an apartment building and don't give us an apartment number, um, if we at least have your age in the voter file, we can tell which John Smith perhaps uh, we're, we're aiming for in that building. Um, same thing with people with the same names who live in the same household, like a junior and senior. Um, that just helps us differentiate who we're actually dealing with. Whereas in person, you could say right. who you were, right? You're, you're similar. Your that's, that's similar to what they have uh, election judges do. Ask for a birth year, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure and, even uh, your birth date is written in the in the voter books as well. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for everyone listening, do we have like 25 candidates? I mean, 25 offices up for election. Is that right? 13 offices. city council members, two BET, one mayor, and nine park board. And so the city convention will be the mayor, BET, and park board, do I have that right? And so yeah, the both ward at large and district and park board. And so you could be, you could be a delegate for the city convention where they do those citywide offices and the park board, and the ward convention. Yes. So there are two. So on caucus night, we elect delegates for both of those conventions. And so you, as a participant who fills out this form, can choose to check the mark that you want to do the. Um, the ward one, then you want to do the city one, both of them, neither of them. Um, really, the only important thing to remember is just you have the entire month of April to fill out this form. Let's, uh, let's talk about though. who's eligible. This... Okay, caucus. So, who's eligible is anyone that would normally come on a caucus night. And so, um, if you're a person who comes on a caucus night, you sign a statement. So, when you sign in, you're signing your name. What you're agreeing to is a statement. And I'll actually pull up the statement, um, but it's it's basically saying that you live in the precinct, that you're a Democrat, that you'll be 18 years old by um, election day. It's called the caucus affirmation statement, and that's actually the um, it's legally binding. It's it's sort of the the philosophical legal framework that that underpins the 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 online version of this is is because that's what's governing the in person version as well the, those that's the same sort of judgment and, and rules that we apply to if that makes sense are you excited yet is this still just as dry yeah. and esoteric as I mean usual I feel like I feel like it's we're gonna have a lot of people caucusing this year right are we gonna break records possibly we'll see I mean there's just really no way to know um, and there's, there's sort of two ways I think we could uh, examine that. One is how many people actually sign up and participate and actually cast votes. Um, so your first votes when you're voting for delegates at your precinct, like you would on caucus night, that happens in mid-May. So I think, um, and then how many people run for delegate, both for the city convention and for the ward conventions. And so just as an aside on that, um, we... Across all 13 wards, there are um, over 8,000 delegates, and that ranges from, um, you know, 300 or so in, in some precincts up to 700-something in other precincts. 
I'm sorry, wards. So some wards have basically twice as many delegates to their convention as others. Um, that's determined by the state party's democratic, it's called candidate average vote. I can go on about, about that later. But basically, the as far as I can tell from the data, from the voter file data, we've never in a in a municipal year where all 13, you know, all 25 offices are on the ballot, we've never been able to fill all 7,000, 8,000 of those ward delegates across the city. Certain wards have filled them up, you know, obviously the ones with fewer seats are more likely to fill up. Obviously, one of the wards that are uncontested um, aren't going to have as much interest in people coming to an uncontested convention. So that would be that would be how I would judge the strength is basically, can we fill every single ward seat? Um, can we get 8,000 people? Normally, it's about four or 5,000, I would say. And, and in a typical year, like you're you're looking at potentially spending eight hours in a in a high school auditorium or something. So as far as attracting delegates, yes, it's, that's not guaranteed. It's a much less much less of a commitment. Okay. Certainly, in terms of time and in terms of brain space, it's much less of a commitment. Um, I on that note though, there there's no reason why these conventions need to be so long and terrible necessarily. Um, I think there's and volunteers, I guess, is is the is the short answer. Um, the more volunteer, everything is volunteer run, and from me on down. And the obviously, the more volunteers you have, the smoother and faster things will go. Um, part of it too is like we we just need to be more creative. So I've been chair for three years. This is now the second endorsing year um, of those three years that I've been chair, and we've not been able to put on a convention either of those years. And I was really looking forward to it, especially this year, to kind of disprove that conventions had to be boring and stupid. Um, certainly there will be like downtime, but a significant amount of downtime is counting the ballots. So in the, the city convention, for example, um, it's you're, you've got like, what, 12, 13 races essentially um, that you're balloting for. And that takes time to pass out the ballots and blah, 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 blah. So you can move to electronic balloting, which is a lot of money, like um, $15,000. But um, electronic balloting takes each round of balloting from 45 minutes to 5, 10, 15 minutes. And so um, basically, if you're balloting three, four times an hour, five times an hour instead of once, that really changes the dynamic of the convention. And then when you add, say, a DJ or poetry or um, theater kids, so all of our... Um, that's one other thing I'll mention is every municipal office is on the ballot this year, except for school board. Uh, school board is even years and even years are our business conventions where we elect officers and stuff. And so um, our goal for 2020 and now for 2022 would be to get public school students basically to do that stuff, to read poetry and play music and put on skits and ask the questions of the candidates and, and that kind of thing. So I think, um, yes, this year is going to be a lot simpler, but I, um, why don't we put in a plug for next year too? Um, hope this can sort of help you reset your expectations. I guess you could say. Are, are you going to be borrowing anything we're using this year for future years? That's a great question. Um, I would love to. Um, we so our central committee meets on the third Tuesday of the month. The intention of our June meeting is to basically have a hearing and, and kind of debrief about the whole process. Um, I believe there there's there will be appetite. So so the 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 short answer to your question is we have to amend the constitution basically in order to make anything more permanent. And in order to amend our constitution, you know, the state party has to amend their constitution as well. So it just kind of depends on what specifically we try and do. But I think there's absolutely appetite to kind of um, utilize what we've learned and in, in kind of systems that we've put in place to see if we can. Do something cool next time. I'm kind of nostalgic for the painful process. You know, it's uh, you go through you go through that with a bunch of other people, and there's a uh, a little bit of com camaraderie involved <laughs> with with staying in the same high school auditorium for twelve hours. <laughs> so let's talk about security with people that you agree with. Yeah. 
Security, Let's talk about uh, security uh, in person. Or I online? was the the online process because I mean I know what the security process is, but I had forgotten, and so I was like, "What's to stop someone who knows a bunch of names and addresses from going into the Google form and uh, doing some fraud?" And you know, like even in person caucus and convention process, you have accusations of shenanigans. So explain what the security process is this year that will. Sure. You know, so there's two, two main things. One, one is you you have to receive, be able to receive mail at your voting address. So whatever address you put in on the form, you'll get a postcard in the mail um, within a week or so, and it will have a code on it that you would then enter online on the website. Uh, similarly, if you called to register, um, you'd get the postcard in your mail, and then you call us to fill out your your um, your code and same thing with texting. Um, in addition to that, everything is transparent. So um, on an ongoing live basis, we, the Minneapolis DFL and the campaigns, will see people as they're signing up. So we will, as it's live and as people are signing up, we'll have the names, uh, at least with the, we'll have the, we'll have all the information basically. There's, there's, everything will be 100% transparent and there's really no way you can hide anything. Meaning like, for example, if somebody signs up as Mickey Mouse and it's a real address and they're just faking a person or whatever, it's like we can see that Mickey Mouse has signed up and the campaigns can see that Mickey Mouse has signed up and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing, too, is all this information is stored. Um, it's based on the state party systems. So it's built. So the system itself is super robust. Um, there are something like. I don't know, 40,000, 50,000 votes that the state party did last year because they were, it, it was an even year. So every single DFL unit in the state had endorsements. And so that's, you know, tens of thousands of people. So by comparison, it will, will be significantly less complicated. Um, and again, that information lives on a third party server as well. So it's not like someone can delete it, like they deleted our old website. Let's talk about the letter. The mayor and a bunch of other candidates wanted to, basically wanted to cancel the endorsement process this year. I tuned in to a to that meeting, or maybe a meeting adjacent to when that letter came out, and people were mad at you. Uh, talk about why people wanted to cancel the process. Sure. So. Um... Part of this, a part of running for the DFL endorsement process is praising it when it works on your behalf and complaining about it when it doesn't. Uh, not only complaining about it, saying it's corrupt and broken and so on and so forth. Um, so the only difference is this year, a bunch of people decided to complain about it uh, beforehand, before it even started, before the rules were even passed. Um, so the the Minneapolis DFL had been meeting since uh, September, and since October, we've actually been planning this process. And so it's been broadcast to on our Facebook page. It's been sent to the candidates. It's been sent to other DFL members in Minneapolis since September that we've been working on planning this process. So once a month, we met um, all the way through December. We met three times in December. Um, and basically, we've been, we, we spent... 16, 18 weeks putting this together in public view of everyone with the campaigns invited, contributing, putting this all together. And um, the, the sort of two final steps to this were having the state party give its blessing, essentially, in order for it to move forward, and then Minneapolis specifically to vote on the plan itself. And so um, it, it, it was actually fun. You know, I really enjoyed so I'm a nerd, right? A parliamentary nerd. Like I care about running efficient meetings. I care about um, people feeling heard. I care about like getting business done and being good at it and, and not wasting people's time, right? And so we were having fun. We were doing a lot of work, but we were getting shit done. It was starting to make sense. There was a lot of consensus, a lot of buy-in, all this. So then the day uh, it needed to go to the state party, um, the letter was released, which is the letters basically complaining. It said a lot of stuff, um, complaining that that it wasn't inclusive or whatever, whatever. It was it was just junk. 
Um, but what it made it super annoying is that um, I found out about it when it was leaked to the media, to the Wedge Live News media, in fact. I, think, I believe you're the one who broke it. Um, uh, and this was an yeah. hour before the meeting we had to go to the state party to approve. So I was very, very angry. I was very, very, very angry because, like, again, as I had just said, like, we were having fun. We were doing well. We weren't hiding anything. and over half the people that signed the letter had agreed to that, to that, that they felt heard, that their concerns were addressed, that like we weren't finding anything or whatever, whatever. So it was super annoying um, because we were so close and it was obviously just a political thing, which again, people were going to do anyways. The only thing that makes it different is that it happened at the beginning of the process, not the end. Oh, and yeah. And so I so, got really... I so what I'm hearing... Go ahead. So what I'm hearing from you is that you're suggesting this is a group of people who anticipate not winning the endorsement at the end of this process. I mean, That's I who that. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, I, I can't characterize things in that, in that way. Um, two, I would say there was a mix of people who, I don't know. I don't think there was there. You could necessarily pin and it, any, anything specific like that on it. Uh, mostly just, again, the things, the things that made me the most mad were um, people calling endorsement divisive, which when literally it's, it's a very difficult thing to achieve. You have to get 60% of the people in that, in that high school gym to agree to support you. So that's a pretty high threshold. Um, it's the opposite of, of divisive. And not only that, um, being called divisive when um, the, the, like the, this, these people were, were releasing a letter specifically just trying to divide, you know, the group and stuff like that. Um, anyways, long story short, it's all water under the bridge. I that next meeting where we actually had to pass the rules, I was in a real grumpy mood, and I made sure to be grumpy to everyone, and they made sure to be grumpy to me. Uh, but it was good. Um, some people described it as cathartic. Um, I sometimes everyone just needs to scream at each other and and get it out. And like I said, we were having fun for for quite a while. We had a lot of consensus. Then we had a meeting where we all just kind of yelled at each other. And then every other meeting since has been super chill, same kind of thing. Like people people you know pushing and, and asking questions and stuff. But again, feeling heard and responded to and addressed and and like they were building consensus. You know. Somebody sent me screenshots of Carol Becker at a recent meeting in the chat talking about just putting it off until like, we, we can do this in the summer. Everyone's going to be vaccinated. It's going to be great. I've personally registered 10,000 people, 10,000 seniors to get vaccinated. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Uh, yes. So here's what I, so uh, upon the, the notification that, that uh, our esteemed governor has opened up vaccinations for everyone um, on the day that our registration process opens or the day before, um, even still, it's not going to be until I think the end of summer for any, for indoor groups to be safe, I think in any measure, because cool, we're getting 300,000 vaccines a week. Well, there's at least 3 million people that need the shot. And so that's 10 weeks just to get the shot for all of those people. Plus, uh, if you're getting the second shot, another additional, you know, four to six weeks after that for that second shot, plus, you know, the additional time to build up immunity. So from, from a pure mechanical, mathematical example, it's just not going to happen. That and... Um, <clears throat> We're still governed by the state party rules, and I certainly do not foresee the state party saying it's going to be safe to host an in-person convention in 2021, at least not anytime, not within the next several months, I don't think. Um, plus, um, that's something I brought up back in December, January, was, hey, what if we like, um, what if the vaccines are going great and we have some sort of hybrid convention, right, where half the people are in the room watching the speeches live or on tape, and then Others are voting at home, but people shot that down. People did not like that. So I didn't pursue it any further. Let's talk about a philosophical question about the DFL process 
You know, there's a lot of people who are frustrated with how difficult it can be in a typical year. It takes a long time. You have to spend a whole day, multiple days. We have rank choice in Minneapolis. Why bother with party endorsements? It's a one-party town. I mean, I've personally had kind of a, a transformation in my thinking about the process. I used to hate it, and I still think it's terrible but it might be better than not having it because it kind of, it gives, it gives an upstart campaign a chance to make a name, to prove they're viable, to show they can organize on a smaller playing field than simply going straight to the election. So let's talk about that. Sure. Well, first I, I agree with your statement and your characterization. Um, that it's we we would be worse off without it. Um, I as I said earlier, it it doesn't have to suck, you know. And there's certain like, oh, I can talk about that later. But again, the it's it's a numbers game, and so if you can get your people to show up in every corner of the city um, where you're on the ballot, you can you can win, and you can. Doing that is a much lighter lift than raising $100,000 to send a, a piece of mail to every person that's going to vote in your election in Minneapolis. And so I think for that alone, I think the caucus process basically is the reason why we have people like Keith Ellison in office. It's the reason why we have people like Ilhan in office. It's um, because it's a beneficial way to coalesce around a good uh, for a candidate, for the reasons that you said, both in a in a seat that's um, open, for example, when Keith Ellison first ran for Congress and when uh, Ilhan first ran for Congress, running for an open seat, and if you're trying to topple an incumbent who um, basically doesn't do their work and, and just needs to be nudged, nudged out sometimes. And so... Um, Thinking back to 2016, when when Ilhan ran and got elected to the state house, in that convention, I believe I wasn't. I was there at the beginning of the day, but not until it went to midnight and was in a stalemate the whole time. And blah 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 blah, and this and that. But like, um, it works. So so there is so that that's the answer. Is it's practical? It works um, philosophically. Uh, people hate the Democratic Party. Um, I hate the Democratic Party. I agree. I think there's, um, I think the 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 distrust and the dislike and the hate, frankly, is is well earned. All of that said, um, in Minneapolis, Nancy Pelosi is not in charge. Like Chuck Schumer is not in charge. None of these people uh, about the, especially the more establishment parts of the Democratic Party that we all find annoyance with. None of those people are relevant here. What's relevant is you. It's the people that show up to caucuses, literally the, the smallest unit of small D democracy. And I think it's important, especially within Minneapolis, to say, to get together and say, we, this is what we believe in. Like as Democrats, as people who, you know, care and who want to make a difference and, and coming to an agreement on that, or at least, you know, duking it out and arguing about it. And so I think that's the other important reason, besides the practical reason, the philosophical reason of asserting our dominance as, as urban Democrats, both within the state and within the country. Okay, we're, we're clipping that sound. We're putting it on YouTube. Devin Hogan, Minneapolis DFL chair, saying Democratic Party is terrible and you're justified in hating the Democrats. It's true. And and like I, I think they're doing obviously like uh hooray for the American Rescue Plan. I think it's important for Democrats to be better at gloating and messaging about that. Um you know, but like at the end of the day, the, the same issue applies, which is that you know, total corporate hegemony over our economy and, and that's starting to break now. And, I, and I'm and i extremely pleased to see the Democrats uh, learn their lesson at the national level, I think, compared to Obama's uh, term, but um, still not good enough. We gotta, we gotta keep pushing um, and that's our job. That's our job on the ground here is to keep pushing and, and making that noise and being unified around, around that stuff that we care about. 
Are you running for re-election next year? Yes, I'm running for re-election next year um, for okay. my third term. So third please term. caucus next year. Wow. Okay, you have two 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 year terms. Yeah. Okay. So every even year business convention is when we elect officers. And you're coming to us from the school. Lindale neighborhood. What's that? I was just going to ask where you're coming to us from today. I'm live from the Corcoran neighborhood. So I, um, so for, I lived in Minnesota for 11 years, 11 and a half years, all on the same two blocks in Lindale um, until February 1st. I I bought a tiny house in Corcoran um, that I could afford because it's a tiny house and it has no yard, it has no garage, has no alley. It's pretty excellent. How tiny? How tiny? tiny. Uh, 668 square feet. So it's actually larger than my one bedroom apartment, but um, it's a pretty big for a tiny house. But it's pretty tiny. That's about. Yeah. So um, I love it. When I lived in Chicago, I lived on an L station. I lived on the Armitage L stop. And so um, my, my bedroom windows would rattle every five to 10 minutes uh, for the entire four years I lived in Chicago, um, I could open up my kitchen window and touch the station um, from, from the kitchen window. So I really um, am enjoying living next to a train again and hearing train noises. It, it brings me joy. <laughs> and I, I heard a rumor you have cats. I have a cat. Um, I can show d- delivery. You have, you have a cat. Okay. On my lap here. Yeah, it's it's the part of the ep- it's part of the episode where we show cats. His name is Kitty. Uh, he's a good boy. Um, so a friend of mine, Kitty, actually came from Whittier. He came from um, my friend uh, Jen Cater's backyard, and um, they so they bought their house uh, from it, it had been uh, vacant, and someone had fixed it up, but. Before that person had fixed it up, there the basement windows were all broken, and there was a feral cat colony apparently. And so they were used to many cats. Colony? How many cats? How room. many cats is a colony? That's a good question. You have to ask them. But basically, like they, it seemed like there would always be a, a, a contingent of cats, several like two or three cats rotating out in their backyard, sunning themselves and such. And then um, one day, uh, this this fellow kitty um, appeared and and sat on her feet. And, and they thought, okay, you're not like the other ones. And so um, they kept him for about six months trying to find an owner, couldn't find an owner. And um, their their uh, baby at home that they had raised um, from a kitten just, just did not get along with him. And so she posted on Facebook and um, I met him and now we're friends and we hang out. Um, I mentioned him. <laughs> yeah, I mentioned him as a family member on, on the budget uh, testimony. Um, back in December, which I didn't do to get a shout out on Wedge Live, despite what Wedge, Wedge Live said on Twitter about it. <laughs> oh, did I tweet about that? Did I tweet about your cat? Yeah, so I mentioned it on this budget committee call, and you were live tweeting it, and you were like, the next caller had mentioned his cat, and uh, which is clearly a ploy to be tweeted about by Wedge Live. <laughs> I think I think I remember that. Okay, do we do we have any final plugs? Do we need to give out websites and phone numbers? Any additional information to keep people informed about how to participate? Yeah, so MinneapolisDFL.org. It's all on there. Um, it's in four languages on there. Um, caucus.dfl.org is the website where you actually go to register. Um, uh, it's pretty easy. You uh, type in your um, address and it sends you to the correct form for your precinct. Um, the numbers, I'm going to post them in the chat, but um, if you're calling, that phone number is 612-552-4215. Again, call in any language um, and we'll figure it out. Uh, 612-552-4215 for the um, calling. And then for the texting, it's uh, 612 612- Seven one two seven four six one six one two seven one two seven four six one for texting. Um, 
But it generally, if you have the ability to download a podcast and listen to it on your device, um, you have the ability to fill out a Google form at miniapcaucus.tfl.org. Like I said, it's pretty simple. Um, month of April, that's all I got to worry about. Um, everything else will show up in your email inbox. And don't worry, the campaigns will, will find you if you haven't voted and make sure that you do. So, um, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Enjoyable. Thank you for joining me today. Any Anything else? Um, Final thoughts? Well, yes. So I do have final thoughts. But I have actually have a lot of thoughts that aren't DFL related, uh, perhaps that we could say for a different time. Um, unless I mean, you... we, we're, we're only at 35 minutes. I figure it's not really an overlong podcast until we hit 60. So if sure. you've got 25 minutes of material, let's go. Well, I, I kind of want to rant and rave about everything on earth, but, um, you know, if you think that's appropriate for the podcast, I don't know, are we currently live or will this be, uh, Oh, this isn't live now. I mean, it's not going to be edited. So if you say anything ridiculous, I'm not editing it out. Beautiful. uh, Excellent. We we can make it a special double episode with Devin Hogan. The first episode is informational and the second episode is just ranting. Excellent. Uh, two-way ranting and raving. Okay, so here's here's the first thing I'm going to rant and rave about: Nicollet Mall South. So we have a um, we have a transit and pedestrian mall downtown, obviously with Nicollet Mall. Um, I when we reopen Nicollet Avenue, um, I think it's important that we make that street transit and bike and pedestrian only. Continue to divert the traffic onto Blaisdell and, and First and only have the buses go through. Um, I think that's the best way you can really anchor a new district that you're starting from scratch like that. Um, And what I lived, so I lived on Nicollet Avenue for over five years and all things considered it being a major North South street, there's not a lot of traffic um, because of that, because of those diversions onto the one ways. And since the one ways have been calmed with the, the separated bike ways and, you know, possible future heavier infrastructure, um, I think we should fight like hell to have a Nicollet Mall South on at at that damn, damn Kmart on Nicollet and Lake. So that's the first thing I would say. I can keep so going. from Lake from Lake Street to downtown, have it be a transit and bike. Ideally, bike yes. Only. Um, I think um, I recognize that may not happen to start. So I, I perhaps to start even just um, Lake until 28th or something or 29th, but absolutely um, we don't need the streetcar, but like if, for example, the streetcar has to be built um, now, I won't even pretend about that, but like, I think it would behoove us to have a, a transit spine through South Minneapolis like that. And one of the things that makes Whittier tolerable along that stretch of Nicollet is the fact that it's cut off by the Kmart. Like it keeps people from using it as a through street. And so it's a little more pleasant than it would otherwise be. So there's a risk of losing that, making it much worse simply by opening it up back to anyone who wants to drive their car down through Whittier. 100%. Yeah. Next topic. Uh, do I have to choose a topic, or do you want? Do you choose the topic? I mean, you're you're the one who came with your list of things to rant about. I ran I ran through my list of questions on the DFL process. Sure. We could talk about well, Carol okay. Becker. I have to I have to apologize that I didn't load up my soundboard, so we don't have any Carol Becker sound, no fart sound effects. <laughs> Do you have, yeah, is, is there a name yet? Is this the Wedge Issues podcast? It's the Wedge Live podcast. I figure that's the easiest for people to remember and search for. And we finally got approved on Apple, so you can find us on Apple now. I should get my voicemail number, although, although I don't remember what it is. Because I'm trying to get people to call in, leave voicemails, nice. so we can play them on the show. Were you ever in college radio? No. Hmm. This is my first time on camera or producing audio. Excellent. 
Yeah, I was on, um, we, and this, this was ancient at this point, but college radio was a, was a fun activity that I liked, um, especially the calling in part. So I totally get it. I'm in favor of calling in. Um, I guess one other thing I would add about the Kmart, and, and it may be moot at this point, but um, are you familiar with the mural that's on the back of the Kmart where Nicollet Avenue ends? I think so, yeah. I can't remember exactly what it is. Describe it. It's a it's a battleship. So it's a battleship, um, a massive battleship coming down the street and a person in a suit physically closing a door as this battleship comes down the street. So the compromise, so for, for those of you that don't know the history of the Kmart, basically um, the city got um, urban renewal slum clearance money to tear all of that down with the intention of rebuilding it and rebuilding the tax base. Um, surprise, there was a recession. Um, so they were desperate to refill that tax base and they gave Kmart A, the ability to shut down Nicollet, but also um, that super cheap rent that was sort of the reason why they were one of the last Kmarts to hang, up, hang around after all these years. So the compromise was that the neighborhood would be able to build a, a paint a mural on the back of this Kmart and the mural, like I said, is pretty incredible. It's a battleship cruising down the street with a person in a suit closing the door on Nicollet Avenue. And so this, and it's loaded to say this, but this being our Berlin Wall, as it were, like I think it's important to preserve that mural. Um, and if we're, we're looking at, um, for example, I think it, it, it's just cinder block. You basically, you just put iron beams on either side of it and you can pick it up in sections and lower it down into the greenway. And so basically you make one of the retaining walls in the greenway, this, this mural, and it's sort of like an, a reflection of, can you believe we did this? Like, this is not a place of honor or so on and so forth. And so that's the only other thing on that particular subject of Lake and Nicollet that I would say, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then some some guy from the excerpts would come in and buy it, like uh, like they did with the Kmart sign. It's in some guy's front yard. That was devastating. Um, the Lindale neighborhood and some Lindale neighbors were interested in pooling money together, but once basically once it hit two thousand dollars, it just that kind of got ridiculous. I did get to see the the crane you... take the K off the building, though. That was a fun activity. Okay, I have my voicemail number. People want to call. You won't be featured on this episode, but possibly a future episode. You can call 612-440-9320. That's the Wedge Live hotline. Leave us a voicemail. Okay. What's next? Excellent. You don't have any more hot topics? No, I've got plenty more hot topics. Um, let's talk about the park police. So um, okay. the park police are um, part and parcel of the, the Police Officers Federation, um, formerly under Bob Kroll. Um, it costs $5 million a year, uh, which is about 5% of the park's budget, which, as we all know from other budgeting, is not necessarily a big amount. But the park board, being only 110 or so million dollars a year, $5 million bucks is it goes a long way. Um, so at any given point, there's only six park police officers on duty. So three squad cars out and about um, throughout the entire city. Um, obviously, we have a big city with a lot of parks. And they're on the same radio as, as the Minneapolis Police Department. So if, um, if a call comes to respond to a park for the police, whoever is closest, whether it's a park police or a Minneapolis police, is going to be the one that responds. And vice versa, if it's a call, and a park police uh, squad happens to be closer, they're the ones that are gonna respond to that call. Um, in fact, um, the first person to respond to the George Floyd call was a park police officer. Um, 38th in Chicago is only a block away from Phelps Park. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, um, that we have an independent uh, a body that can tax and spend independently within our city that has its own police department that is part that is separate, but also um, linked to the, the Minneapolis Police Department. Whereas all the other de the other departments, Metro Transit, um, County, all of that stuff, all of that stuff is at a super municipal level rather than at a sub municipal level. So it's something we have control over as voters and as people on an independent elected board. Um, 
In addition to that, when I ran for park board in 2017, I asked people all the time about the park police. And the only impression, only impression that anyone ever gave to me was all they do is drive around on the walking paths. So that's that's the normal interaction that the average park person has told me without fail um, is that all the park police do is is drive around on the walking paths. And so the stuff that they don't see is basically that they're just extra cops that are floating around the city. Yeah, and I, I had seen video of park police breaking up an encampment. I think it was Powderhorn last year. And the uniforms are identical to MPDs, which is something I didn't know. I guess, like, I didn't know what a park police officer even looked like until last year, based on that photo. Yes, and they, they recently changed, they might have changed the uniforms. They certainly changed the cars, so the cars now have a green stripe on them. But again, they look identical to MPD, except for that color. And so when I ran in 2017, I, that's one of the things I ran on was actually doing that kind of stuff and differentiating. But like, the more that I learned is the more that I campaigned and, and looked over the budget over the years. Like, it's in, it's inextricable. The only the other thing I would say is that um, so that's the park police. We do have the park patrol. And they're the ones that drive in the ATVs on all the walking paths instead of the squad cars. And they're the ones that write you a ticket for smoking and um, parking tickets and that kind of stuff. And so um, uh, everyone's favorite good pumpkin, Andrew Johnson, um, suggested many years ago that we, we have a park ranger system instead of a park police system. And so I think the park patrol is the thing that's closest to a park ranger that we have. In theory, in practice, the park patrol is just a way to get on the park police, which is just a way to get into the MPD. Um, so uh, that's that's what I've got to say about the park police, uh, I guess. I don't know if you have any other questions. That's, that. that's the career path, park patrol to park police to MPD? It's our career path, certainly. Um, and again, like, what's the purpose? Because that's the thing, too, is, like, you have to understand all of, a lot, and the park patrol is often um, seasonal, but the parks hire tons and tons and tons of seasonal people, lifeguards. I know someone whose job it is to um, look at the boats as people are pulling their boats out of the lakes to make sure there's no zebra mussels and hand them flyers about zebra mussels and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there, I think, with seasonal hires around uh, like a park ranger type system. Um, the other thing, well, I can, I'll, I can talk about parks until the end of time, but um, any other questions about the park police specifically? You, Otherwise, I can... Are you sad that you don't get to run for park board this year? Uh, you no, said you don't get to no, run for park board um, this year? I, I know because um, I'm enjoying doing what I'm doing um, with being, being a party boss. And so, like, being not from Minnesota, um, I appreciate the ability to be, um, I guess, direct and clear and... Um, aggressive, right? And so the, for, for those of you that don't know me either, I'm a queer person. Um, I'm non-binary, uh, transgender under the, the kind of bigger umbrella. Um, so as I, as a queer person, right, I, I occupy a lot of, um, I don't want to marginalize spaces, I guess you could say, but at the same time, I wear a suit of armor, right? I am a white, I have white skin, I'm a white person, and I'm masculine appearing. And so um, there's a lot of, within, within my role as a DFL chair, there's a lot of like spaces that need to be navigated where it's helpful to look like that and, um, and be able to use that suit of armor to advocate and, and argue on behalf of marginalized people coming from not um, a white savior complex, but but an own understanding of of my own marginalized statuses that are invisible, um, and 
and I would never ever call myself a marginalized person at all, but but just in terms of like somebody put it, uh, so when you're asking about the meetings where they all people shouting at each other, like in the past they were too, and it's just a lot of like, for lack of a better word, white supremacy. Um, and obviously I'm complicit too in, in sometimes in white supremacy, all white people are and stuff, but like, as somebody put it, like I'm able to talk to the cishets but I'm also able to talk to the queer people, the um, non-white people, and like not be an asshole and not be a shithead and be an asshole and a shithead to the, the rich people, to basically the people that are disrespectful. Um, and I, I can get away with it because of my white masculine body. That took a turn from the park board, but I'm enjoying my job. We, we got, my we got job serious. For sure. Yeah. Public meetings are hell. Like my, I got my start caring about local politics mm -hmm. by attending a neighborhood association meeting. And it's like some of the nastiest stuff <laughs> you can ever experience at these little neighborhood association meetings. And that radicalized me. Yeah, and I'm here today with, with this podcast absolutely. only only because I attended a neighborhood association meeting in 2014. I think that's a fair assessment. Um, what radicalized me was um, I went to, for old heads know, uh, Nicollet Avenue was was first basically paved in the 1970s and hadn't been touched since then. And so like in the early 2010, well, in the 2000s even, it um it was an absolute wreck. In fact, Sebastian Joe's had that, uh, and they probably still have it, Nicollet Avenue Pothole is, is an ice cream flavor. And so I went to um, the meeting where they were presenting the plans for Nicollet Avenue, and they had actually proposed narrowing the street significantly, having bump outs and having bus priority corners and stuff. And um, in the church basement, people complained about the snow plows. They complained about parking, of course, even though parking wasn't really being taken away. They complained about the street being too narrow and therefore bad for businesses, too narrow for car traffic, but wider for sidewalks and stuff. And um, so the city, which had actually presented a thoughtful and useful plan that would have been good for pedestrians, went back and changed it and made the street four feet wider, uh, made it awful to cross. Um, that's what drives me nuts is it's like, do you drive the snowplow? Why do you give a shit? Like you, you're not the person that gets paid to drive the snowplow person that drives a snowplow can drive around the curve as it bends like the, 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 it's a vehicle it has a steering wheel it can drive it can it can maneuver this is not a, a, a like ridiculously difficult problem to solve so that's what radicalized me um but i've been on my neighborhood board for five years now um for the lindale neighborhood and um i've been vice president for three and we've been Man, in, we had a meeting, which was apparently three years ago today, where um, about public safety. And so this would have been probably just before Justine uh, Demond. And um, good Lord, uh, that Fox 9 was there because Tom Lydon is a neighbor of ours. And um, basically, the, this meeting started out with a history of policing and the police and, and um, slave catchers and just all of it centering us and grounding us and, and doing the work to explain the histories of these systems and how that is brought into today. And like, it just immediately devolved into white people screaming about virtue signaling. And it was pretty wild because um, we've empowered these people for so long and they're very upset to, to see um, as we put it at the time, like as a neighborhood, we talk about city services all the time. We talk about the parks, we talk about the library, we talk about housing, but we never talk about police. Let's talk about the police. And um, that was a bridge too far, but we've come a long way um, since then, for sure. Yeah, 2021. I'm a little, little concerned that, that uh, I don't know. I guess we can't get too specific about 2021 because uh, you're the Minneapolis DFL chair, right? You're not allowed to have opinions. Yeah, and, and actually that's the other reason why I like it is I can't pay attention to the campaigns. Like I, 
besides that, I can't actually get involved in pick sides and stuff. It's just like my job is to manage the what these these fifty something sixty campaigns are participating in. So like that's my that's all I'm paying attention to is the fact that there's sixty of them, not what any of the individual ones are doing. Um, and so that's kind of a fun way to participate by by rules that that that's the level I'm at and, and really all the consideration I can give. And so it's really kind of a fun, unique perspective. Although, um, and having been a candidate myself, like although knowing, that's what's kind of, well, I was going to say it was just yeah, having been a candidate, like it's, it's been fun to having gone through the process and now running the process and being like, okay, here's things that I'd like to improve as a candidate that I wish, you know, I had and stuff. So being able to kind of do that as well. Yeah. And you know, that's the thing that's kind of stressful about 2021 for me. There are six, there are 60 candidates. The vast majority of them are terrible and it would be depressing if they won. That's what stresses me out. You got to look at these 60 candidates and imagine what if that person won? (laughs) Yeah. So again, I, I, all I'll say is I've enjoyed Except for the people, except for a, a couple of very specific people that are, are trying to pull shenanigans, but I, I've enjoyed working with everyone. Um, I think what I'll say about that is what I think is fascinating is um, sort of the way national politics is sorting itself out, um, for lack of a better word, around cultural signifiers. Um, I, I kind of see that same thing happening here at the local level. And um, and I don't know if I can say anything good or bad about it at this point, but that, that's certainly something I've observed, I guess you could say. Um, and I'm, I'm, what I actually am most curious about are the charter amendments. I think that's going to be sort of a wild card. Um, but it's also, I think, going to be a very good thing for people to organize around um, because the charter amendments are bigger than any individual candidate. You know, there's, there's several candidates that are running for and opposed, of course, but even like um, candidates that are running against each other that are in favor of many of these charter amendments. So I think that'll be a good opportunity within Minneapolis um, and within the DFL for us to build our power around um, things that are kind of bigger ideas than just individual candidates, which I think benefits everyone. Yeah. And there's, there's a certain style of candidate who's running to make changes with MPD, running for city council, claiming they're going to make big change with MPD. We're going to have a different public safety system with them elected, but also running against the thing that would give them the power to actually do anything about police. It's like if you're against the public safety charter amendment, you want a city council that has no power over police that just leaves it to the mayor, leaves it to the chief. So that's, that's a dynamic I'm watching. Council candidates who don't want power over police, but will brag about the change they're going to bring. Yeah, I guess all I would say is, um, so the Minneapolis police department was created I think either at the same time or around the same time as the city was founded, uh, it took only 30 years for the Minneapolis Police Department to be called the shame of Minneapolis due to its legendary uh, corruption and um, ability to injure its its residents. Um, One of the most important strikes of all time in labor history uh, was here in Minneapolis, the Teamsters strike in the 1930s. Um, And same as it ever was, the police department and the downtown business interests conspired to break the strike. Um, and so the Teamster strike was all of the, the, the warehouse drivers downtown in the warehouse districts. And, and so um, because it was downtown, like the downtown council was involved, may have still have even been called the downtown council at that point. The long story short is like the, this, this exact same pattern has repeated for the entire history of of this particular police department, um, and uh, most of them too. But like, and, and one could one could make the argument that we shouldn't abolish all of the police departments. I'm an abolitionist personally, but like, 
I, I think that there is no there is no good counter argument to to our to Minneapolis specifically our police department. I just personally, again, speaking my personal individual capacity, like we should have learned our lesson by now, and 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 that's the one thing I hope we we do finally learn is that this system is going to keep doing specifically ours in Minneapolis is going to keep doing the same thing it's always done, no matter what we've ever tried to do to not make it do what it's always done. Yeah, it would be a shame coming out of 2020, having this opportunity to make really big systemic changes to public safety in Minneapolis. If we simply just retreated into the same old law and order style of politics like if we if we went more conservative in 2021 especially because i think things are looking up with that big stimulus big rescue package big progressive agenda there and to retreat into conservatism on a local level would make me sad so let's end on a sad note we're, we're at 60 minutes. <laughs> okay. uh, I guess I just will say um, the, the, the outgoing council having cut $8 million from the budget is not nothing. So I do think that's worth noting and celebrating and um, taking as, as a first step. Um, obviously, it's not necessarily transformational, but it is in the sense that the investments it makes are transformational. It's actually fully funding the Office of Violence Prevention. And it's really the basis of the model I think that we can uh, use going forward. Even if the charter amendment doesn't pass, I think there's, it's there, there's, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot we can do and we, we've certainly taken a first step. So I think that's worth acknowledging and, and celebrating. And I think, I think uplifting the Office of Violence Prevention, all those alternative responses, putting it on par with MPD, not having MPD be the top, be the only thing we think about in terms of public safety, like reorganizing that structure, having someone at the top of it who isn't necessarily a cop, who can think about public safety holistically, I think it is a good thing. Right. And like, and if you look at all the calls that they're currently responding to, almost all of them are not violence. It's traffic stops. It's just, it's just stupid crap that we don't need to send an armed response to. Um, in addition to the, in, in addition to these upstream investments, like the Office of Violence Prevention. So the dollars and cents, that's the other thing is if we're, if people want a fiscal conservative argument like dollars and cents, the cops are not a good use of money. And the cops will, well, the cops won't tell you they're a good use of money, oh, yeah, that's use it. Of money, but they will tell you they're not equipped to do what they're asked to do. Just, and they get that. But they want their toys. They want yeah, their On top of the yeah, tens of millions, ten, ten, endless millions in police abuse and murder settlements. Okay. Yes, that's very bad. We're done. I'm going to press stop. Our property taxes may go up. I'm pressing stop. Thank you for joining me. Everyone should go caucus. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. MinneapolisDFL.org. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now.